Hi, my name is Sharon Mayer and I work as a clinical nutritionist at the Institute for Health and Healing. Today we're going to talk about preventing and reversing insulin resistance, prediabetes and diabetes. And on the menu today, we're going to be looking at this as an epidemic, not just an American issue. We're going to understand the blood sugar and insulin metabolism, what are we eating, is it our genes, insulin and inf inflammation and what should we eat, real food, food is pharmacology, we'll look at some of the labs that we think should be used and stress and supplements. So this is a major em epidemic. We used to call this syndrome or this diagnosis syndrome X, adult onset uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, pretty much a term for the same thing just with varying degrees of severity. It has been projected that by 2020, one in two, that's every other person will have type 2 diabetes. This is no longer just an American issue. And since 1983 to 2011, type 2 diabetes has increased from 35 to 350 million and estimated to grow to 550 million by 2030. These numbers don't account for insulin resistance or prediabetes. But the great thing about this is that 95% of type 2 diabetes is modifiable by lifestyle. So if we look at the Inuit Indians, their traditional diet consisted entirely of protein and fat, and they had very little disease. Now, since their diet has changed, type 2 diabetes, alcoholism, and all the other things that we know about has become a huge factor of their lifestyle. When we look at obesity and diabetes in India and China, this has grown out of all proportion and is concerning because it's overwhelming both the country's health systems. And it is now estimated that between India and China, more than half the world has type 2 diabetes. But what's more concerning is that we're not even looking at prediabetes or insulin resistance. In Africa, and particularly in South Africa, where HIV used to be really predominant, the concern now is really about diabetes, obesity, diabetes, lung cancer, strokes, heart disease. These are the diseases that are always related or mostly related to lifestyle change. Asia Pacific, they too face diabetes challenges. In less than 50 years, the population of Pompeii has gone from having no diabetes to a prevalence of 43 percent. It's huge. In France, obesity and diabetes has now become a major political issue. McDonald's is more profitable in France than anywhere else in Europe, which was really astounding to me. And more concerning, of course, is obesity in children. And this is growing at such a fast rate. When we look at South America, Brazil, global food companies have fundamentally altered traditional diets and sent the national scales spinning. And Mexico, who's the biggest consumer of soft drinks in the world, uh, where diabetes is already the number one killer, has a huge, huge weight problem. And this is really concerning for so many people. So the next thing we're going to be looking at is the mechanism of blood sugar and insulin metabolism. So how this works is that when we eat a diet of refined carbohydrates, that is food without fiber or nutrients, very high in sugar, empty calories, things like white bread, rice, cakes, cookies, soda, pasta, candy, all those things we know we shouldn't do, they break down very rapidly into glucose and then pass into the bloodstream. And insulin's job is to pick up that glucose and pack it away. It's called the fat storage hormone. Now over time, we continue to consume those high carbohydrates, empty calories, high sugar foods, and more and more insulin is required to do the job. And what happens with that is that insulin, the whole insulin production system spir spirals out of control and we end up with more insulin in the blood. And our bodies become resistant to insulin. We know that the insulin resistance, the prediabetes, the type 2 diabetes is not about a deficiency of insulin, but too much of insulin. And it is related, this insulin resi related, resistance is linked and related to all the diseases we know. Prediabetes, diabetes, heart disease, insulin growth factor, cancer, inflammation, osteoporosis, and all the rest. So how we control blood sugar and insulin is a huge, huge part of what we need to be doing about changing our lifestyle. So ponder this, we eat 156 pounds of added sugar per year. 
about 31 five pound bags for each of us, or about 50 teaspoons or half a pound a day. That's about an extra 500 calories in a day. And if we eat 25 tons of food in a lifetime, and each one of those elephants represents eight tons, so if we're eating about three of those elephants, what is the proportion of good food and not so good food? If we're eating so much sugar, what proportion of that elephant is sugar? And how is that in fact impacting our lives? So when we look at what the top foods are in America, iceberg lettuce has absolutely no, no nutritional value. It has a bit of fiber, maybe. Tomatoes, these include all the sauces. Potatoes are mainly French fries. Bananas, of course, everyone says bananas and potassium. And then oranges, which is mainly as juice. So let's talk about genes because so many of my, my patients would talk about their parents having type 2 diabetes and that it's a concern for them. Well, our genes are pretty much set, but it's the information that we send to our genes that can express an ill health. And Morgan Spurlock, who did Supersize Me, was a great example of this. His vegan fiance, a chef, used to pr pretty much produce most of their food, which was really healthy. And he decided that he would do this documentary to see how much weight he could gain in a short period of time, being 26 days. After about three weeks, his doctors had decided that it would be a smart idea for him to stop the program because all kinds of other things had elevated, like his cholesterol, HB1C, diabetes, all the markers for ill health. And if he'd continued on that line, they'd be concerned about whether he would be very ill. So this was a great example. So what we eat, the nutritional value of what we eat, speaks to the genes and they can express in ill health or not great health. The next thing we're going to talk about is inflammation, and this is pretty much covered in the media in every which way we look. And inflammation is an interesting aspect of this because it is the commonality of all diseases. So cancer, heart disease, even when we're looking at upregulated cholesterol, we're looking at a form of inflammation, diabetes, arthritis, autoimmune. This is all inflammatory. And it's about how we can actually turn down the volume of inflammation that's important. And one of the things that we do know is that insulin is linked to inflammation in a very huge way. Upregulated insulin can be very inflammatory to the body. So here's a really nice little study that came out in 2012 where they were looking at the as they were looking at chronic inflammation being the commonality of all these dis of all these diseases, but also looking at abdominal fat. So that fat that we hold or carry around the waist, extremely inflammatory. And here's a really great picture of this. We can see all the diseases that is linked to this overweight. Because again, fat tissue is so very inflammatory. It increases cytokines in every which way. It's not something we want to be having. The other part about this is somebody who's extremely thin, what's the skinny on skinny fat? Someone who's very thin but has lost a lot of muscle may be over fat. So when we look at something called MONW, which means metabolically obese, normal weight people, we're looking at people who've lost muscle over the years, and that is then replaced by fat. So they have a lot of fat, but little, but very, very little muscle. And that's, a, that's of concern. And that's where the BMI can be a bit of an issue because the weight on the scale doesn't actually categorize whether there's uh, a percentage of muscle to body fat ratio, which is, why we at the Institute of Health and Healing use the bioelectric impedance analysis. This is a great little machine and it gives us a great ratio of what happens between muscle to body fat. So when we look at foods, there are three main food groups, vegetables, vegetables, and vegetables. We are really deficient in the amount of vegetables we consume. And trying to increase that in the day is something that we really need to, we really need to aim for and have as our goal. Let's talk about real food. If it comes from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. So phytochemicals, these are the things that we get in, in fruits and vegetables. You want to be thinking color. Phytochemicals are much more important than vitamins and antioxidants. These are, the, these are things that can change genes in, in such great ways. So rainbow is important because 
the blues and the and the purples have anthocyanins in them. These are phytochemicals that are really important for our health. The oranges, the yellows all have lutein and zeaxanthin in them. They have beta carotenes in them. These are absolutely important too. And then of course, let's not forget the leafy greens. We want to choose organic whenever possible, or if you even go to the Environmental Working Group, EWG, they'll show you a list of the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. But the fruit and vegetables are absolutely prime. And I'm actually going to go one step further and say vegetables are more important because sometimes the fruit can be a little high in fructose for people that are dealing with type 2 diabetes. Cruciferous vegetables, these are the things like arugula, bok choy, broccoli, broccolini, the list is over there. But these are huge in helping support the body in many ways, and particularly the liver. They're involved in supporting detoxification, pretty much clearing the junk out of the body. So we want to, we want to be eating at least one serving of those a day, and it's not so hard. If you think about a cup of arugula, that's a small part of a great salad. Some broccoli, that's just a cup and most people seem to enjoy those. Adding a little bit of garlic and a little bit of olive oil to those vegetables always make them really delicious. Teas are good to drink, green tea especially because it has EGCG which is a phytochemical in it. And some chocolate. Anything over 70% is great because again this has high amounts of phytochemicals and less sugar and certainly less of the dairy products in it. That's real food. So this is an interesting slide to look at. It's an eat this, not that. Vegetables and fruit are important. Protein, fish, shellfish, chicken, eggs, turkey, etc. Want to make sure that the protein you consumed is grass-fed, organic, free-ranged, or wild. The meat or the proteins that the animals we eat need to have been eaten well too. So make sure that those are of that quality. Nuts and seeds are important. Fats, oils, things like olive oil, coconut oil, organic butter, ghee, great, great fats. We need to be having fats. Whole grains, legumes, spices and herbs. I think spices and herbs are such an important part. Spices are huge in reducing inflammation and plus they make food taste really yummy. Green tea, almond milk, coconut milk, rice milks are all great substitutes for just the, the plain old dairy milk. Water, of course, I think this is probably one of those uh, foods or drinks rather that we are very very deficient in so up your water level it's great so not to eat of course would be sugars and sweeteners interesting thing about the sweeteners is that it has the same effect on the brain in as much as that it actually has the conversation about there being something very sweet in the body even though it may be something like splendor or stevia so cutting down those would be a really smart idea removing refined carbohydrates where you can Cookies and cakes and pasta, cereals. As I said, cereals are not, not, not healthy. They processed. Anything you, anything you can shake out of a box is not, is not a healthy food. It's processed. Sodas and juices, trans fats, margarines. Cut that out. It's terrible. Limit your alcohol and definitely watch the processed packaged foods. These are things we know. It's just a little reminder that we constantly have to give ourselves pretty much on a daily basis. The idea is to look at really good food. Eat food. Blood sugar control is three small meals a day, two to three snacks. You start the day off with some protein, always a great idea. In fact, most of the meals should have some form of protein, fat, and fiber. Small portions are much better than something large because that overwhelms the digestive system and you still have a real high peak of insulin. Eat low glycemic foods. So those are the ones that are not going to raise the blood sugar. We know, for example, if you had a handful of raisins, although raisins are fairly packed with nutrients, it'll raise the blood sugar because it's a little bit on the sweet side. But you could have a handful of nuts with those raisins, and the nuts has protein and fat and fiber, and it will offset the, the, the spike of insulin from, from, those, from those raisins. Supplements are not a bad idea, depending on what your needs are, and moving is probably one of the most important things that you can do. You know 30 minutes a day of walking, and it doesn't even have to be a consistent 30 minutes, is what the research is showing as a really healthful way of getting moving. Of course, stress, reducing stress, this is going to absolutely impact your cortisol levels, which means more insulin. So how we deal with stress is 
really an important factor of a lifestyle change. So when we look at food as pharmacology, it's a really interesting thing because it shows how important and how powerful these foods are. So if you have a look at the reds and purples and all the foods that fall under that category, it pretty much covers all the systems in the body, detoxification and blood sugar control and cardiovascular and immune, all of these things are supported by those foods. The reds, the oranges, all of these have such an important impact on how our body functions. The ones that aren't so great are things like omega-6 fats, and again, everything that's very high in sugar and refined carbohydrates. Those are the things we certainly want to make sure that we don't have that much of and reduce them where we possibly can. So when it comes to lab testing, these are some of the labs that we do at the Institute for Health and Healing. We look at the insulin glucose challenge test. HbA1c is about how you manage your insulin levels and glucose in the last three months. Lipid profiles. These are cholesterol and the likes, which you probably have every six months or, or certainly annually. An NMR lipid profile is very similar, but it's a much more um, detailed report, and it starts to look at the particle sizes of cholesterol. C-reactive protein is about insulin. We always want to be looking at where that goes. And vitamin D3 and the end point of vitamin D3 metabolism, which is 1.25, is really important in how we reduce inflammation. So is homocysteine, fibrinogen, ferritin levels, uric acid, and liver function tests. So these are some of them that we do, not all, the, all of them at the same time, but certainly pieces of these tests. At the Institute for Health and Healing, we do customized and individual plans for patients because your needs are going to be very different to someone else's. Omega-3 fish oils we know are very good for, for helping overall health, but they're very good in helping with insulin resistance. Uh, vitamin D3, as we said before, looking at your levels and getting those established is always a great idea. Multivitamin and mineral, and the quality of that needs to be very important because that can depend on how you absorb those nutrients. Magnesium, chromium, and lipoic acids. These are three nutrients that we know are very good for helping with blood sugar control. However, this doesn't mean to say go out and buy all these supplements today. We really would like to look at what your needs are before we even suggest that. Again, stress is something that you need to deal with. And I say you because each one of us has a different way of how we handle this. But I will say that just getting out and walking would be a good way to start reducing your stress. It doesn't have to be the 30 minutes. It could be 10 minutes. But just that small amount of time can help people feel a little bit better about where they're going with and what they're having to deal with. So thank you for joining me today. And I hope you found this worthwhile.